We're now at a point where over 90% of Americans uh, across the political spectrum believe that marijuana should be legalized, no one should be going to jail for this. Unfortunately, they also think that it has been legalized and no one's going to jail for this. And, you know, we've had a quarter of a million people arrested in the United States last year, 92% of them for simple possession of cannabis. We have close to 3,000 people in, at the federal level serving long-term, some life sentences for amounts of cannabis less than dispensaries deal with on a daily basis, tens of thousands more at the state level. Um, and, you know, in a lot of places where we, we've actually seen D.C., where I live, uh, where you used to live, um, when legalization of cannabis was passed because it's an adult use model, not a decrim model, uh, we actually saw arrests go up for young people. Uh, so we're responding, we're pushing back on that. Today's guest is Kat Murdy, the new executive director of Students for Sensible Drug Policy, or SSDP the country's oldest and most influential student group challenging the war on drugs. Before taking the helm at SSDP, Kat was a longtime staffer at the Libertarian Cato Institute, a founder of Feminists for Liberty, and an SSDP chapter head at UC Berkeley, where she attended undergrad. We talk about the role that young people in particular can play in ending prohibition, why marijuana has yet to be legalized at the federal level, and whether Donald Trump and Republicans or Joe Biden and Democrats are actually worse when it comes to drug policy reform. This interview was taped live at an event co-sponsored by the Psychedelic Assembly in Midtown Manhattan. Go to thepsychedelicassembly.com to get more information about their events and membership options. Here is the Reason interview with Kat Murdy. Kat Murdy, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, let's start with uh, what is Students for Sensible Drug Policy? For people who aren't familiar with the organization, when was it founded? What does it do? We are the largest youth-led national organization working to end the war on drugs. Okay. So we were started in 1998, um, and we have right now roughly about 100 chapters across the United States. Most of our chapters are um, at the college level, but we do also have community chapters made up of alumni or folks who've been kept out of the higher education system because of the war on drugs. Yeah, talk a little charges. bit about that. What, how, how does having a drug conviction uh, keep you from going to college? Well, a lot of different ways. That's actually the very first issue that SSDP was founded on in 1998. I know libertarian crowd, I'm a libertarian myself, but it was about the uh, Higher Education Act um, and Pell Grants, which were one of the biggest uh, federal federal funding for colleges. Um, you could not get one if you had a criminal conviction for drugs, even if it was a, um, you know, a simple marijuana possession conviction, you could not get one. That was not true if you had a rape or murder conviction. So this was our first issue and it's kind of yeah. grown from and there. It, and it's still in force, right? It is. We did get um, a win on that about a decade ago mm -hmm. uh, where you can now get that funding if you've cleared the before you start college and mm -hmm. you've completely finished um, all everything, but not if you get it while you're still in so, college. Um, talk uh, first about the kind of traditionally, how has SSDP worked to uh, roll back the drug war? What are, what are the main issues uh, besides kind of student access to higher ed? Um, That's what actually are the main not issue? our main issue, and it okay. hasn't been since yeah. the early 90s. Um, so since we are a grassroots organization, our chapters work on very different things. What good drug policy looks like in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is very different than what mm -hmm. good drug policy looks like in Pittsburgh, California. Um, we do have some big national programs, um, but overwhelmingly, uh, our roughly 10,000 alumni who have gone through have changed a lot of policies on the local levels. They've helped shape a lot of the cannabis campaigns. Uh, I'm an alumni myself, and I helped run the 2010 cannabis campaign in California. Unfortunately, didn't quite win, mm -hmm. but um, a bunch of That was of a real shot across too. the bow, though, because nobody expected to to do as well right. as it, it was did. the first it was the first yeah. uh statewide campaign since the 70s and yeah. it was we almost squeaked by it's actually uh it was stoners against legalization folks who uh were benefiting from uh the 
illicit economy, semi semi legal gray economy, whatever you want to call it, who didn't want competitors in their market. Then wow. That's what I would so say. That's the, the old one. Baptist and bootleggers thing. Exactly. That is one of the reasons why bad laws, especially around things like booze and drugs, stay in place, right? Where right, absolutely. people benefiting from the illegal status don't want things to change. Drug lords, kind of, the and DEA. drug dealers. Yeah, and then the, the people whose whole existence is putting people in jail, they have a, a pretty good relationship. Right. Actually, uh, we've been hearing a lot about that. Uh, so we just came out of Washington, D.C. We mm -hmm. had our 420 Week of Unity. Mm -hmm. We uh, worked with a large coalition, left, right, industry. You know, 420 was like a month ago. <laughs> but you guys are just like, oh, man. No, but wait, talk, about, stopped, right? talk so, about the 420 Week of Unity. Right. So we put together this giant coalition because... There's for too long, there's been too infighting in the movement mm -hmm. and uh, people just really haven't focused on the mission, which is ending the war on drugs. We're now at a point where over 90 percent of Americans uh, across the political spectrum believe that marijuana should be legalized. No one should be going to jail for this. Unfortunately, they also think that it has been legalized and mm -hmm. no one's going to jail for this. And, you know, we've had quarter of a million people arrested in the United States last year, 92 percent of them for simple possession of cannabis. We have close to 3,000 people in, at the federal level serving long-term, some life sentences for amounts of cannabis less than dispensaries deal with on a daily basis, tens of thousands more at the state level. Um, and, you know, in a lot of places where we, we've actually seen D.C., where I live, mm -hmm. uh, where you used to live, yeah. um, when legalization of cannabis was passed because it's an adult use model, not a decrim model, right. uh, we actually saw arrests go up for young people. Uh, so we're responding, we're pushing back on that. And so we uh, came together with this big coalition, really mm -hmm. uh, getting everybody who traditionally has uh, been sort of bogged down by like, oh, the left, the right, you know, mm -hmm. we have all this momentum behind it right now. There's what, four cannabis uh, legalization bills being bandied mm -hmm. about Congress. Um, and one of them's the right wing Republican bill. One of them's the center left bill. One of the, and so we just really haven't come together as a coalition. And so this was the first time to do that. And part of this was because we're starting to legalize and we're seeing groups like the DEA. We're hearing from folks that they're actively going up on the hill and pushing back and trying to stop cannabis hmm. from legal being legalized. Do you do you think that can happen? I mean that you know, the, the progress that has been made, particularly at the state level, because it's still illegal, um, at uh, marijuana is illegal at the uh, federal level. Can it be rolled back? I mean, is that part yes of the complacency? Yes and no. Yes and no, right? Because I think that the cat's out of the bag. You, we have these Apple store-like dispensaries on every corner. Uh, someone was talking to me about their weed concierge a couple minutes ago. Mm. Like, we're not in, uh, yeah, right? We're not in uh, the world that we were when I got started in trying to legalize cannabis in 2007. It's That's done. Right. But- People are still getting arrested, and I think that if we if we allow ourselves to become complacent on this mm -hmm. issue, it's really easy for a lot of those wins to stop. It's really easy for us to lose that message of um, individual ownership, self-sovereignty, mm -hmm. the ability to uh, use drugs as we want. It's easy for... Um, certain uh certain industry interests to again mm -hmm. if you want to talk about bootleggers and baptists keep folks out of this continue that criminalization um and it's also easy for politicians it, to make us feel that this issue is done where right. the white house is trying to do that right now with mm -hmm. us you know they've they've done what two uh two of the ma biggest uh cannabis pardons ever didn't let a single person out of prison right uh, we're we're hearing now. Oh, okay. The DEA might be the DOJ might be rescheduling cannabis. It might be going to Schedule Three. I've been hearing from folks over and over and over again. Congratulations, you won. We didn't win. Rescheduling's not legalization. People are still going to get arrested. You're, uh, you know, there's the FDA's never approved a plant medicine. They certainly haven't approved smoking anything. Uh, none of that cannabis being sold in dispensaries, at least in flour form, is FDA approved. Uh, it's not a win, right? So I think so, that if we lose that momentum, that's it, that's where. What what is your, you know you you said you know over ninety percent of Americans favor you know basically treating weed like beer, wine, and alcohol, you know more or less. W who is the politician at the national level? Because there are state level politicians and whatnot. You know, 
what when it's how there, dumb the are, how are dumb area, are politicians right? not to be the you know the brave Spartacus who's going to say well, I'm so going to support something that, that nine out of ten people that. believe at the at the level like no. uh, one of one of my friends just met with the White House. He got Kamala Harris to say on ca- to say on camera we should legalize marijuana. President Biden said that we should legalize yeah. marijuana. Let everyone out. Zero all records. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've uh, we have what. Elizabeth Warner, uh, Elizabeth Warren, Warren, sorry, um, you know, picking out her dream blunt rotation. uh, And it's not just the Democrats, it's Republicans, too. Everyone knows that this issue is trendy. They want to be on the right, the right side of history. They want to get the votes for it. They're just counting on the fact that people aren't actually doing their math, checking their homework, Mm -hmm. making sure that they're actually voting to legalize. So what um, you favor full legalization? I do. Not, All drugs. Yeah. Okay. And how does that work? Um, you know, does that mean that at the federal level there are no laws governing you know no, drug so use or have, actually... you know sketch out? Because a lot of people will say, no, that would be chaos. Yeah, so this is one of the biggest. Um, so when we decided that one of the major things we were going to work on this year was descheduling cannabis, um, we've started to hear a lot of pushback from folks like, oh, well, the government's not just going to remove all cannabis laws. Well, that's not what descheduling cannabis means. And I should say, actually, descheduling marijuana. It's not cannabis mm-hmm. that's in the... Uh, that's in the Controlled Substances mm-hmm. Act. It's the word marijuana. That's what's created a lot of these weird, um, you know, almost draconian laws in places like New Jersey where uh, cannabis has been legalized. Marijuana is still illegal. And the difference mm. between marijuana and cannabis is do you have a state license to be selling it in your dispensary mm-hmm. or are you selling it unlicensed on the street, right? Um so when we talk about uh, descheduling cannabis, a lot of people are saying, but you're just saying you're just you don't want any laws. And, you know, my my internal anarchist tendencies aside, that's not actually what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. You're talking about removing it from the Controlled Substances Act. All the other existing laws would continue to exist, but it allows states to really start uh, moving in more of a legalization direction. Uh, we see it's legal in the majority of the country now. Mm-hmm. In some form, but right. it's actually only quasi legal. You know, if you're on federal land, that's a problem. If you're trying to enter into the banking system, that's a problem. Um, you know, th- there's a wide variety of things. So it just basically allows us to move in that direction. Is there a state that you think has done the best job with marijuana legalization? Oh, that is a good question. I think that there are wins and loses, right? And I think that we've really been experimenting really fast. This has been an opportunity for us to really try out a lot of these ideas. Um, We've seen in states like California and Colorado... Uh, the impacts of high taxation and how they kind of push people back Which into is the where legal market. In, yeah, in places like California, in California, it's fifty percent. You're paying fifty percent in taxes, and a right? majority of weed that gets consumed comes from the black market. Right, which yeah, is a absolutely. sign that the which regime is, a sign is not that good. Maybe yeah. it's not working so well, right? right? Um, so we see stuff like that. We also see some of uh, the best in state laws, for example, like. Uh, the state of Minnesota, when they passed, they've passed a uh, retroactive justice. Um, so resentencing, expungement, what this means is that people currently in prison, they can potentially get resentenced. It was actually supposed to be the case that everybody um, with the passage of the law, anybody who had a criminal record for cannabis that would no longer be considered a crime now, their mm-hmm. records would be cleared. There have been hurdles to that happening, whether it's you know, whether people have a paper record or if it's, um, you know, digitized, things like that. But I'm not sure if there's one best model, but we have learned a bunch of different things. And I think what it comes down to is we want to make sure that one, uh, we have a full decrim model, not mm-hmm. an adult use model. Adult use model is something like what you talked about, mm-hmm. you know, wine, beer, right? 21 plus, and it's illegal for everyone else. So for example, I think I mentioned this, but in DC, Um, When Initiative 71 passed, which I think is great, it allows uh, people in D.C. to possess, to grow, to gift, um, and to consume cannabis, but only people who are 21 plus. And so we actually saw arrests go up for young people under the age of 21 who now have a target on their back. What's the fix to that? Is that to just say that marijuana use should be presumed? No one goes to jail. Okay. No one goes to jail. No one... 
you know, maybe maybe you can't buy it in the store. Maybe that might be something, but we don't lock you up. We don't give you a criminal record. We don't Would you stop lock up, you from. Let's say it's, yeah, I'm just uh, thinking here. It's, a you know, a bar. You know, we say people can't drink under age 21 and the kids don't go to jail, but the bar owner would or they would lose their license. Would that be the similar model? I think that model? there is a conversation that we can have around that, right? But I do want to be careful with that kind of thing, whether it's, you know, a, a 21-year-old um, college student is passing a joint to their 20-year-old roommate. You know, mm-hmm. is, does that then become a federal crime right. or even a state-level crime? Is it something like, you know, someone doesn't know that their their friend is uh, underage? Is it? So I think that criminalization really fundamentally is an element that we need to remove from this. Do you think that is widely shared among that 90 percent or whatever of, of Americans who say, you know what, yeah, weed should be legal? Are they with you on that? Or is that? You know, they that is a really good question. No. I think that they are with me to the point that we don't want people going to prison for this, right? You know, a lot of uh, a lot of those long term sentences, we got people sentenced under conspiracy laws because they were deadheads listening to the Grateful yeah. Dead and they were passing joints. And if around you want to put and- them in jail, put them in jail for bad musical <laughs> taste, right? Not for, not for their drug of choice. Not quite my musical taste yeah. either. I actually like the Dead, but it's an easy joke. But um, what um, could you talk a little bit about? You know, your group is called Students for Sensible Drug Policy, and I think. You've started, and we're going to talk more about other sensible aspects of drug policy that your organization is pushing. What is the role, uh, uh, particularly of students or young people? What do they bring to this movement, you know, that old farts like me don't? Yeah, so we are students for sensible drug policy, but like I mentioned before, yeah. not all of our members are currently students. Um some of them are alumni. We have mm-hmm. a large alumni network, but it's also the fact that people get left out of the higher education system because of criminal charges. They also get left out of mortgages, all sorts of things, right? So we are young people, and it's because the war on drugs is really fought in the name of protecting children, protecting young people, and yet they are the ones who oftentimes are most targeted, even as I said, even now as we're moving forward with some really positive drug laws, they're continuing to be arrested. They're continuing uh, to get pushed into drug courts, things like that. Um, you know, it's been fought with young people's lives on the line. Yeah, and like sometimes wars, it is their right? lives, it's, right? War is always, you know, wars are always fought on the backs of young old, people. Old yeah. men's ideas, mm, young men's yeah. deaths, right? Uh, um, yeah. Well, you know, what's good about the drug war, you know, men and women. You yeah, know, it really doesn't. <laughs> it care. is gender equal, not entirely. Everybody, there's some, there's everybody, some differences yeah. in the policy yeah. outcomes, but yeah, absolutely. So, um, what, so young what people it, get targeted, yeah. but I think there's another part of this here too. We keep hearing about how young people are so disengaged; mm-hmm. they're not interested in the political system, and I think that's just so blatantly, obviously not true. You can look at the young people, you know, <laughs> protesting or rioting or whatever you want to call it on college campuses all over right now today. You can look at the fact the like open. Open TikTok, open all these apps. Like people have strong political opinions. They're just not finding anyone who resonates with that, right? They don't support a specific candidate. They don't want to come out and vote. And I think that there is a big role for us as young people to really get active and to to use that as a trading point because both the Democrats and the Republicans and everyone else, but really the two major political mm-hmm. parties are dying to get young people out to the polls for them, right? So I think that if we show that, hey, you know, if you are willing to pass some more sensible drug laws, things that are based on science and compassion and don't, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that don't lock people up in cages, that don't cause more overdose deaths, that don't do all these things that do um, impact young people at a much higher rate, then, you know, maybe we might be willing to come out for that. Talk a bit about the um, concept of harm reduction. You mentioned a bit, you know, about stopping overdoses. Uh, you know, the the golden era of opioid prescriptions is long past, but uh, you know, we continue to have more and more overdoses at record levels. How is that a concern for students for sensible drug policy? And how Absolutely. do you, how do you work to change that? Well, I would say the number one cause, uh, the number one harm 
of drugs is drug policy. It's drug prohibition. You mentioned opioids uh, we've seen over and over again. When they further criminalize opioids, when they try to crack down on prescriptions, uh, we see overdose rates go up. When uh, What explains that? Because I think yeah, when you tell because, that to people, a lot of times they're as, like, oh, that, that can't be right. It's the same thing as when you um, raise the taxes on cannabis or marijuana, people go and buy it not from the licensed dispensary, right? So it's the exact same thing. It's not as if the demand disappears. Uh, but, um, and especially when a lot of times what we're seeing now with a lot of these opioid restrictions is that people who really do need opioids, they're in horrible yeah. pain, you know, they they have a real medical need for this. They're being cut off by their doctors. They're searching it out elsewhere. And when they're searching it out in a place where they don't know what's in that drug, they don't know what's happening. And the people who are selling it to them oftentimes don't know what's in it. Um, people die. People die. It's a huge concern. And I mean, there's much larger. We could talk about why um, fentanyl is more likely to be in more drugs now. And it's not just opioids. It's now all across the board why uh, we're seeing things like xylazine and stuff like that. And it's because, so you know, how if you, do you can guys... only carry a little bit, you need small amounts. So right. what do we do? Yeah. How do you, what do you guys do to minimize those? Yeah. So really one is absolutely outcomes. we start with uh, policy. And part of that is just legalizing drugs. Legalizing drugs is how we stop people from dying from drugs. Like, and the um, analog here is in the uh, prohibition. You right, know, fewer, exactly. Fewer people right. die I mean, from bathtub gin. How many people gin. do you hear yeah. about today who are dying from bathtub gin? Not so many, right? Um, but and, and even in the modern day, in yeah. places that have criminalized alcohol, um, state of Gujarat in India, we see higher deaths from alcohol yeah. poisoning. Same thing we see with drugs, right? So that's the part, first part of it. We've also worked to pass Good Samaritan policies all over the country. What that means is that uh, when someone is being harmed uh, by drugs, when they've uh, when they are potentially overdosing, you can call for help, and instead of the police being sent you can actually get medical attention, which was not the case for a very long time. And a lot of people died because of it. Um, we also, uh, you know, we have a lot of students who uh, are active in direct street level um, harm reduction. And so they're doing things like they're teaching people how to test drugs. They're using fentanyl test strips to check whether fentanyl is in drugs. They're tracking uh, they're tracking your bunk acid. They're doing that kind of stuff. They're also, you know, going out with naloxone and doing this. We actually did uh, the first ever um, opioid, um, opioid overdose prevention training at uh, the National Cannabis Festival mm -hmm. in um, in D.C. last week. But And we passed out so much Narcan and so many fentanyl test strips to people throughout the whole week all over the place. Um so that's definitely a huge part of it. It's also drug education. It's making sure that people understand um, how these drugs work, how they interact, how your how uh, the setting in which you do them, how uh, your pre-existing medical conditions, other drugs you might be taking you may not even be thinking about, you know, your daily uh, antidepressant that you might have or your heart medication or things like that, how that is going to interact. It's about having... Um, removing the stigma so people are able to do drugs in safer locations mm -hmm. uh, with the right people. How, you know, if something is a problem, if they need help, they can reach out to it. It's just, it's removing all of those elements that prohibition, that prohibition brings in that actually kills people. Talking about, you know, kind of drug safe spaces or safe spaces for drugs. Uh, some, some people also talk about safe supply particularly for addicts or people who have abuse problems. Um, we seem to be at a, a stage now where many people in the, you know, most people agree that the drug war is a bad idea or, or it's not being prosecuted. You know, even for supporters would say it's being prosecuted in a good way. But then you hear more and more people now saying, look at San Francisco or look at Oregon. These are places that have either officially or indirectly have decriminalized or legalized drugs. And what you get is you know a horror show of human depravity uh, that makes normal, responsible people flee cities or leave Oregon and things like that. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about how that is a misunderstanding of what's going it's on? It's an absolute misunderstanding. So let's talk about Measure 110. This okay. was uh, 
Oregon's bill, this is, uh, it was a ballot measure that essentially uh, decriminalized all drugs. Uh, when we talk about decrim, it gets confusing, especially between different states. It means different things, et cetera. But to some level, it removes the criminal penalties for having drugs. That's that's the most basic level of decriminalization. Um, and this should have been a major win for drug right. policy, right? Like this is the direction we want to be going in. And yet there was just so much politica, uh, politicization and it became a convenient scapegoat. It became a convenient scapegoat for honestly the fairly progressive politicians in mm-hmm. Oregon, in Portland, to start blaming things like uh, homelessness, like mental health issues uh, on this bill. And of course, these problems have existed in Oregon for a long time. They were a problem. I mean, I remember there being articles um, in the New York Times mm-hmm. about uh, homelessness in Portland in the 90s, right? Like those problems have not changed. It then just became a new way to point it out, a new problem to point it out. I think there's also another element of as well, which is um, uh, not just that it becomes a convenient scapegoat, but also um, a lot of other problems have led to uh, more homelessness, whether it's inflation, whether it's the high cost of homes and not enough other homes being built, whether, um, so this just became an easy thing to blame. Uh, it, they're just, we didn't do enough to support it. We didn't do enough to point out what wasn't happening. And we also didn't do enough to make safe spaces for drug use and to really actively pursue what a healthy drug culture or a drug using culture could look like. And let me be clear, we all use drugs. Every single person yep. in this room uses all drugs. Right. And I don't just that mean is illicit actually, drugs. it's a condition of entering the space that you have to be, uh, <laughs> check you no. at the door. Drug no, but uh, continue door. with yeah. that a little bit. What do you, you know, this we all is, do. seems very we, important. It could be something as simple as caffeine or even sugar or chocolate, which has both caffeine mm-hmm. and another drug called mm-hmm. theobromine in it. Um, we all use drugs on a daily basis to change our mindset, to change, um, to change how our bodies feel, to hopefully make ourselves happier and more productive and better able to engage in the world, right? Um, what happens is sometimes there is chaotic drug use, and that chaotic drug use is oftentimes caused by outside conditions. There are, of course, like certain genes and things like that, but are you familiar with the Rat Park uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Why so, don't you explain? Yeah. That a so for bit. folks who don't know about this, Rat Park um, is essentially uh, a science uh, experiment that they did, where they, um, for lack of better terms, addicted uh, dr- uh, mice in a laboratory or rats in a laboratory to uh, various types of drugs. They put them in an environment, uh, a cage devoid of any real stimuli, any you know, bright lights, uh, no happiness, no communal support. They cut them off from other rats. And these rats would just push the bar all day for more and more and more drugs, right? Uh, And then they took other rats that they also created a physical addiction to drugs in. But then they put these rats in an environment with lots of other rats. And they put them in an environment with lots of different stimuli that also gave them positive experiences. Um, And those rats were not pushing the bar. And they could even take the rats from that first group and they could put them in this. And over time, they would slowly stop pushing that bar all day. And they wanted, they were seeking out other types of stimuli, other types of happiness, right? And this is what's happening. When you cut people off, when you say that people who use drugs, we create this stigma and we remove them from society. We prevent them from being able to get jobs. We prevent them from being able to get houses. We prevent them from being able to pursue education. Uh, You know, we cut them off from social networks. This is so important. Um, That's what causes the problem. That's what sends people further and further into these spiraling, um, you know, chaotic or unproductive, unhealthy drug use. And so, you know, we really need to create, create these environments where we remove the stigma. We understand that, yes, not all drugs are good for all people. Not all drugs are good in all situations. Not all drug use is positive drug use. But a lot of drug use is, first off. And secondly, those stigma, this kind of, um, you know, tough love, lock people up in prison, give them a criminal record, um, you know, don't invite them to your family reunion, whatever it is. That causes a whole lot more problems than the drugs themselves ever have.
What what do you do just to kind of pursue this a little bit more in you know places like San Francisco where you'll have open drug use, uh, you know, and and not just people smoking weed or drinking, although that's common, but you know, shooting Needle up drugs, and things for like example, that. Yeah. Um, what do you do with that? Do you allow people to continue doing that? Do you move them out of sight? Uh, you know, well, what? so we talked about safe spaces, yeah. right? We talked about safe spaces, not in the way that uh, right. some other folks have probably talked about mm-hmm. them on this podcast, but um, you know, safe injection sites or things like that. Um, those can be a huge boon. They can also be really beneficial for the community, particularly if they're kind of spaces that you know contribute to the community in a larger way. Um, you know, you give people people a place where they can do those things and you give people a place where not only can they do those things but they can do those things and they can get safe drugs that they know what's in it they know that it's been tested they know that this is going to be the exact dosage that they want they know that they can now do this and then go back out and go to you know do their work the next day or they can you know they're in a spot where they don't have to be you know worried about what's going to happen like what's the weather going to be like is someone going to come bother me am I going to be unsafe all of those things really help and most people don't want to be in this sort of um honestly not very safe not very enjoyable place for them they would like to be in a better place to do this and is it too glib you know there's a pretty good meme floating around that is you know here's a safe injection site for alcohol and it's a neighborhood it's a saloon, right? Yeah, right, right. And so you, this is where you run into a lot of yimbyism mm-hmm. because people, a lot of people like the idea of safe injection sites, certainly, um, or safe use sites, right. various types. And this is also true of like community-based mental health. Right. You know, it sounds they great like if it's things, on the other side of town. But they don't want yeah. it in their neighborhood. And I yeah. think so there is that certain level of stigma that we need to remove around that. But Um, it's also what does that place look like? What do the local laws allow for? Like, is there a way that you can make that kind of contribute to the community more? Make it like a beautiful artistic space with things like that that people want to be a part of. You know, I think that there's also a lot to be done there. But here in New York, you know, we have uh, the on-point sites here. Mm -hmm. Um, Actually, um, we have SSDP alumni working at them, running them. Um, And those are the first uh, state legal um, safe use sites in the whole country. And I think that we've seen a lot of uh, benefits come out of it, not just in the form of far fewer people dying, but you also don't see people unsafe on the street. If someone is using, I mean, certainly look around you in New York, it's not like it used to be. Um, And, Mm. you know, you do see if someone is unsafe, if something bad happens, there are people who can come and help them. Right. Right. And I think that that's the model that we move towards. It's not this Pollyanna ish view that uh, all drugs are fine always and there's never anything bad that can happen. That's not true of anything, but rather that um, not all drugs are bad all the time. Right. Not a- and no drugs are bad all the time. There might be some beneficial uses, but it's this larger uh, drug war mindset and drug war policies and this. Um, you know, removal of people from community structures and from support structures and from all of those, that's what causes the problems that we Is don't there, like to see. you know, just a final point on this, and then let's talk about psychedelics a little bit uh, specifically, but um, is there a role for involuntary, um, uh, you know, kind of um, structures or strictures against people? So if somebody is clearly incapacitated and out of it on the street, does it make you know? Is it allowable from your worldview to pick them up and put them in a mental hospital or hospital for a limited period of time, et cetera? Or, you know, or is that never the model? And is it more a, a this kind is of a well, difficult question, no. right? This is a difficult question, particularly mm-hmm. as someone who uh, believes strongly in self sovereignty, uh, personal ownership. You own your body. You have a right to decide what you do with it, right? Um, there is probably a line, and the line is the line at which you start to cause harm to other people, right? Um, but I think that we can also have a more measured benefit. What can we do to prevent harms caused to other people while also doing as much as possible to still give you your own ownership over your own decisions, your own life, your own body? Um, is there a model where, yes, maybe in this moment where someone is you know, having a bad trip and reacting yeah. viol- violently to other people, we get them into a space that maybe they don't want to be in for a couple 
the, the like just enough time to get them to calm down to figure stuff out and then we let them start making decisions can we make that space a less criminalized space a a more um you know a nicer softer space more positive space rather than a punitive space a space devoid of positive uh stimuli as well i mean i think that there's there's some lines yeah. there um, let's talk about psychedelics, uh, specifically we're at the psychedelic assembly in right. midtown Manhattan. Um, what does SSDP, uh, how does it intersect with psychedelics specifically? Yeah. So we do a lot of stuff with psychedelics. We actually have, uh, something called the psychedelic pipeline. It's a mentorship program for young people who are interested in psychedelic, uh, research and, and do you go around therapy. to like high school and, and middle school science fairs? And be like, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Not yet. Not yeah. yet. Um, but um, we do have this program, and what's interesting about it is that we require people to be SSDP members in order to participate in this mentorship program. And it's probably nowadays one of the biggest reasons that people choose uh, to join SSDP is because they hear about the psychedelic pipeline. They're, they've heard something about psychedelic therapy. They want to do it. They don't really understand the larger like legal system around it. They just assume it's something that they can do, which is fascinating to me as someone who's been doing this work for, what, two decades now. It's a whole different world, right? Um, but they come into that, and then they start learning about the larger war on drugs. They start learning about the policies around it, all of that. So uh, we have all of those folks. Um, we certainly we do a lot of drug education around psychedelics and things like that. We are also currently fighting with the DEA in courts to make sure that psychedelic research is not stopped. Um, so there are two psychedelic research chemicals you've probably never heard of unless you are a uh, scientist in a laboratory. They're called DOI and DOC. They have very long chemical names that I am not going to say because I did not study chemistry in school. Um, but in, uh, they're currently descheduled. They're used for research. Um, there's been some really interesting things that are coming about about um, uh, th through using them that might be beneficial for uh, treating things like depression in the future. So really interesting, really valuable research. They're not really used recreationally. Um, the DEA has seized, uh, seized them just a few times since the 70s in outside of laboratories. They're currently descheduled. In 2022, uh, the DEA announced that they were planning on making them Schedule 1 in the Controlled Substances Act. And that means that they that have is, no accepted medical or recognized medical use and a high propensity for abuse or yes, addiction. Yeah. Which, I mean, obviously That's they death, don't. The no death one's, penalty no one's, for drugs. Yeah. No one is uh, abusing DOI yeah. or DFC, really, mm -hmm. in a meaningful way. Um but this also effectively stops psychedelic research and stops the research on these two chemicals, which is a huge problem. It's anti-science. It's anti-medicine. It's, uh, it's anti-freedom. Um, and so in 2022, April, they announced that they're going to make these drugs, uh, apropos of nothing, these research chemicals, uh, Schedule 1. The um, SSDP Science Policy Council, which is a kind of like another chapter model that we have. It's PhD students um, and uh, researchers. Some of them have already graduated. They're, you know, working in universities. They're mostly scientists who uh, come together and talk about the policies that are impacting them when it comes to the war on drugs. They flagged this for us. We uh, sent a letter demanding a hearing in the administrative court Lots of legal back and forth. The DA ended up stepping down, saying that they weren't going to do anything. So that was a win for us. Then late last year, in December, right around the holiday season, winter holiday season, maybe they thought we weren't paying attention, the DA again announced a rule that they were planning on moving DOI and DOC to Schedule 1. Again, within, uh, you know, we started getting our gears together. And again, we started demanding a hearing. Uh, we this time heard back from the DEA. They wanted to do a hearing. We got it scheduled. We've uh, started doing all of that uh, legal uh, back and forth. Um, so it's we're kind of pushing it down the line a little bit. Uh, we're probably going to be hearing about it coming in 2025. But we're at this point now where 
we've got about 40 different scientists who are actively using this, um, using these chemicals in their labs. They can show us that they have potential medical benefits. They can show us that no one's doing, um, you, you know, they're not being abused. And they can show us that there is a lot of value in continuing this research. So we've got the science behind us. We're getting the legal case behind us. But I think where we really are now is that, you know, how many of us in this this room, this is a psychedelic crowd. This is people who care about these things. How many of you heard, have heard about DOI or DOC? How many of you know that the DEA is trying to criminalize? Um, and I think that's really where we are. We, we're at that point where we really want to make sure that the average person, definitely anybody in the drug policy space, anybody in you know the libertarian space, anybody who cares about freedom, who cares about science, uh, who cares about the future of medicine, public health, that they know that this is happening. We want to make sure that the DEA isn't able to sneak this rule by us. You know, we're ready to fight it in the courts, but can we can we win in the court of public opinion? Can people, you know, can we make sure that people know that this is a problem, that the DEA is just trying to s sneak one by us and get more people locked up for what? Trying to learn how to better yeah. our lives. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure everybody in this room, I'll speak for you all, that uh, we all believe in better living through chemistry, right? Because th there is no alternative, right? I mean, like you were yeah. saying, we're all on drugs all the time, and it's we might as well get good at good at it. At a paraphrase, we might as well know uh, what we're doing, right? Stuart Brand. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your personal journey. You are 35 years old. You are. You were born in India. You were raised there. I was in not. Texas, I was actually born, born here in okay. Manhattan at okay. uh, St. Vincent's Hospital. I don't think it's uh, open anymore. Uh, but I did grow up mostly between yeah. uh, North Texas, Dallas, and uh, South India. My family's from Chennai. So I went back and forth up until I was 16. I was spending uh, several months of the year in India, the rest of the time in the U.S. Do your, what, do your parents know you do drugs? <laughs> I never said I did drugs. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, but what does yeah, that mean, so right? Yeah, what yeah, does yeah, that yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. I thought everybody I does coffee. drugs. Yeah. I have alcohol. Um, I mean, like. How, what was it like? Um, you know, I, I guess sketch, sketch a little bit of like, how is kind of drug culture and by that i don't mean like people using drugs but how are, how are attitudes towards drugs even in your relatively you know young life how is how do you think they've changed you know in oh, north radically. texas radically I mean, yeah, right okay. radically think about it um you know so i started working specifically around legalizing cannabis in 2007 uh with normal uh at that point i joined ssdp in 2009 um, and you were at school at Berkeley. At, you Berkeley, Berkeley. at Berkeley. Yeah. yeah. So um, I was involved with Normal in Texas. I went up to California. I looked around for a Normal chapter. And surprisingly, in the Northern California, I didn't see one. Um, someone who is actually in this crowd here uh, started our SSCP chapter at Berkeley. I found out about this. I got hooked and have been involved ever since, right? Um that was a whole different world. I remember in 2007 uh, thinking about, yes, I absolutely think that we will be legalizing marijuana. I think that it's going to happen in my lifetime, but it's probably going to be when I'm like getting old, retired. And then the Prop 19 campaign happened in California in 2010. Uh, I was the field director for the campaign. This was the first statewide cannabis uh, legalization, rec rec recreational, cannabis. recreational yeah. adult use right. uh, legalization campaign um, since the 70s. It's probably uh, the most effective one that had happened since uh, yep. uh, since marijuana prohibition. And um, that really started the ball turning. Right. Like, so we didn't win that campaign. That was uh, that felt like a huge defeat. But then Colorado happened. And then all these other states happen just across the board. Now, e even in places like Texas, uh, we're seeing a lot of decrim bills happening at the local level. A lot of right. people at states are trying to push it. And, you know, as people looked around and all of a sudden people that they knew, people that they loved, people that they trusted, people that they knew were responsible adults in their life used cannabis, used marijuana openly legally and they saw hey the world is not ending like we were told you know that dare model that wasn't true all of these scare stories you know no one's smashing an egg with a frying yeah, pan yeah. right right um 
And the public opinion radically changed. And it radically changed so quickly. Um, like I said, more than 90% of Americans nowadays believe that cannabis should be legal. I look it's forward across the political to spectrum. a future. I had never thought of this until this moment, but I look forward to a future when Cheech and Chong are on our Bitcoin or something, right? Right, like, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But I mean, to, like, we're in a psychedelic space. Think yeah. about even psychedelics. Yep. The, the conversation around it, um, you know, the conferences that happen, who's involved, Wall Street. Um, these are conversations we would not have been having a few years ago. So right. the landscape has absolutely changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you think that's primarily a function of, I know uh, you and other people in the space talk about cognitive liberty. Is it, you know, is it that people are actually looser now that they believe, you know, we have some right to change our minds, you know, literally and figuratively, or is it, you know, is it just the old guard is, you know, is getting old and ossified, the empire is crumbling? Is it a mix of the two or? I would like to say that it is a mix of the two. It probably depends how optimistic I'm feeling on a given day. Um, because I do worry that even though we've seen a lot of wins on issues like cannabis, I've talked a lot about that, uh, even though you know, we're seeing a lot of conversation happening in the mainstream about microdosing psilocybin or things like that, we're also seeing um, fear, fear coming about fentanyl, about uh, a so wide variety Chinese, of other drugs. Chinese fentanyl, Chinese right? Chinese fentanyl, yeah, fentanyl yeah. that is coming in. Your your marijuana is being laced with fentanyl. It's not. That's not a problem. Um, but we're, we're hearing yeah. that. There's yeah. all of these new scares. We're hearing about... Um, you know, we're hearing about the opioid epidemic as a problem. What we really need to do is crack down on doctors prescribing. And we're seeing these laws come about. That leads to new deaths. We're uh, seeing all of these anti-vaping measures, even though, uh, you know, I personally don't like nicotine. But uh, it is a drug that helps a lot of people. It's a drug that a lot of people have had problematic relationships with. And vaping has made them a lot safer and really had a real harm reduction be benefit. And now all of a sudden we're criminalizing that. Um, I think that that prohibition mindset has just shifted onto which drugs are considered um, more more acceptable amongst certain levels of society, certain members of society. And so I don't think that yeah. fight is over. Um, talk a bit about, so uh, you grew up in India and Texas. You went to Cal Berkeley where you got turned on to drug policy. You've spent a lot of your career at the Cato Institute, a libertarian yes, think tank in D.C. You started a group called Feminists for Liberty, which um, – is kind of trying to broaden the way libertarians talk about sexual uh, or sexual identity and yeah. things like that. Um, you know, is there a through line? How does that, you know, how does that put you in a great position or, or a tough position in at SSDP or among the drug reform movement? Let me tell you how I found out I was a libertarian. And I say found out because I've always been a libertarian. I think throughout my whole there life, I was believed a, a in test strip freedom. For that. Right? There is a test. <laughs> there should be right. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's called the four-way political test. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I was 15 years old. I was uh, debating on a message board because that was a thing at that point. Um, saying that, yes, of course, marijuana should be legal and not just that all drugs should be legal because we own ourselves and we own our bodies and it's a nonviolent uh, offense. And so anything that's nonviolent and consensual shouldn't be a crime. However, I was concerned about what taxation and regulation might look like under a legal regime. And so I was like, oh, so you're a libertarian. And I was like, I'm a what now? Yeah. Um, I took the four-way political test. It said I was a libertarian. I Googled that. I found the Cato website for the first time in my life. I was like, oh, these people are making all those arguments that I thought uh, no one else thought. And I was going to have to go study political science and write a book because we always want to write books, right? Um, so that's how I knew as a libertarian. I've always been a libertarian. Mm. I joined Normal after that. I joined SSDP after that. Uh, I said I joined SSDP as a college student in 2009, went on to become an intern. I ran what was a, a, a program that we called Amplify. We no longer do. Maybe it's coming back as ED. We don't know. Connecting uh, touring bands with the drug policy reform movement. So we would promote the touring bands. They would promote SSDP. We would talk about drug policy, um, you know, and I was on the board for 11 years. I did. Um, I, I think we actually had a conversation on the recent podcast many years ago about yes. intersectionality because right. I chaired our intersectionality committee called various things as the term changes over mm -hmm. time for 
eight and a half years. Um, these are all things that I've done as a libertarian. I would always do them as a libertarian, right? That said, I do think that, you know, as we've moved forward in this space, as uh, it's become less of an issue of, you know, we should legalize weed and more of an issue of, yes, but how? What does a licensing regime look like? What kinds of regulations do we need? That kind of thing. Um, but also as our society overall has become more polarized, as we've seen a lot more political tribalism, as, you know, folks block people who have a slightly different opinion than them on, you know, whatever their local ballot issue is, and we don't want to engage anymore. I think that there has been, that it has become a lot more heated space. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I care about deeply because I think that it's really stopped a lot of wins in this area. And this is people who care about ending the drug war that you would think our mission's focused on this. And yet when it becomes about team red or team blue, or, you know, is, uh, are we left wing? Are we right wing? They suddenly start getting a little cagey about what they want to support. And so I think that there is a lot, uh, a lot that we can do with bringing folks together. So that's kind of what our 420 Week of Unity was all about, was about, hey, let's get, it started with a conversation um, back in November of last year. Let's get all the serious people in the room who care about cannabis to get together. Uh, we spent a few days hammering it out, discussing all the things that we disagreed on, right, left, industry folks. Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that we can all agree that we could do, we can do this year, we all agree on that we can go into the space and say like, hey, this isn't a left issue, this isn't a right issue, this is a simple freedom issue. And so what we came up with was descheduling cannabis, releasing all cannabis prisoners, and clearing uh, marijuana charges from people's records, no. right? right. Um, yeah, yeah, we should do it, we should do uh. it. Um, um, let us, let's pivot when you, you hear applause, let's pivot to, uh, the audience Q and a, and I'm going to ask you to ask a question, uh, not recite the pledge of allegiance or a series of random thoughts. No filibustering, but, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, Kat, um, if you were a politician, I would be joining your campaign. Yeah, people you, tell me that all the time, but so, libertarians don't tend to win. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, the way you articulate and the fact that you could cut Nick off before he finished a question yeah. is really extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Nick, yeah. for bringing Kat here. Okay. And I, I have a question for the audience. Is there anybody else besides me that didn't look at their cell phone during this entire interview? <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, you well... Uh, that was miraculous for me. Uh, that's really all I wanted to say, that, that, that w what you both are doing for society is so important. Uh, I, I, th I was going to bring up something about, I, 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 you know, I, I met a guy a while ago who did some prison time for first offense, a small amount of cocaine, and he met a, a lot of black people. In the, in the federal yes. prison, who were doing 12 years mm -hmm. for marijuana. So the issue of racism, which wasn't really no. brought up, and I don't think necessarily if you have to bring it up, but um, I think that's also an important, such an important consideration. It's for a sure. huge Thank consideration. That's it's great. a huge Thank part you. of the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the very first, uh, the very first drug law, anti-drug mm -hmm. prohibition law that we had in this country was specifically uh, to keep the Chinese out, right? right. And it was where um, smoked opium was criminalized, but uh, other forms yeah. of opium, as it was used as laudanum by vic white Victorian ladies, was just right. fine. Uh, and we have seen a lot of um, racialized impacts of the drug war over the mm -hmm. years. Uh, cra the crack versus cocaine sentencing disparities mm -hmm. are a huge part of them. It used to be 101 uh, they're the same drug. Crack and cocaine are the same yeah. drug. And you know what else they are? Adderall. They're right. th that legal drug that a ton of people in this room probably use every day to go to their jobs, go to school. Mm -hmm. um, and yet there was a disparity where people who were consuming it in one form were going to prison for and getting right. sentenced at 100 times the rate. Now that's been moved to 18 to 1 disparity, right. but... It's ongoing. It has racialized impact. And just to complicate that even more, you know, a, a lot of the disparity in sentencing actually came from the Congressional Black Caucus because the crack trade was happening more in their districts and areas because 
when you criminalize substances, you push people into certain types, you know, into uh, a because lower income. Because prohibition yeah. Prohibition doesn't work. But it creates all the problems that I, people associate with drugs. Yeah, and, and then they say we need to d- criminalize more things in order to deal with this. Um, you believe in reparations for uh, victims of the drug war, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, can you talk a little if, bit about them? Yeah, let's yeah. talk about it. Let's talk about what that could look like. If you got locked up for drugs, for specifically, let's say that you got locked up for selling weed, And now there is a dispensary down the street. Maybe you were doing time locked behind bars while that dispensary was selling larger amounts of cannabis in a day than the amount that you were locked up for. If we're going to start talking about social equity licensing, who should be first in line? Those people, right? Let's clear their charges. Let's make sure that they can do things like go get a mortgage or go to university. But let's also pay them back for their time that they spent, those oftentimes tens of thousands of dollars of fines. Let's make sure that not only can they actually participate in this legal economy that they help build, that people are making billions of dollars on, but that they're first in line to get those licenses. Great. Uh, Next question. Yeah, so actually, funny enough, my question touches on that last last little bit. Um, Marijuana here in Manhattan, it's been legal for what, a little over a year or something like that? I don't don't know. complicated (laughs) right so but you know there's been a lot of criticism about how that's done right with um maybe an excessive focus on the taxing structure and some of the controversy around what you were suggesting about who's first in line to get those licenses um what do you think are the lessons we can learn from what's been done here and um maybe in particular related to who gets the licenses first that kind of thing great yeah thank you yeah absolutely i think that's a really great question i mean the biggest lessons that we can learn not just from New York but from everywhere that we have done this is that we need full decriminalization. People need to stop getting arrested. People need to stop getting criminal records, getting locked up. Uh, when it comes to uh, licensing and reg- and uh, regulation, certainly I think more people should be able to get those licenses, period. And, you know, if we are going to ta- be talking about things like uh, restitution or um, social equity or things like that. Let it go to the people who have been impacted in those communities, specifically by drug laws, like the people who haven't been able to thrive in the way that they could have and should have and haven't been able to contribute to their communities in the way that they otherwise would have because we locked them up because they had a, they smoked a joint on a sidewalk or whatever it is. Can right? I so. ask just a, to play devil's advocate, but what if those people are not necessarily very good business people. Well, then their business will fail. Okay. Right? Yeah. But here's a problem yeah. with the social equity licensing model that I'm not going to say applies mm-hmm. everywhere, but applies in a lot of places. They're actually a two-track mm. uh, to getting that license. And the people who are getting those social equity licenses have much higher barriers uh, to jump through mm-hmm. to be able to get that. It's a harder license to mm-hmm. get. And so you're supposedly helping people, but you're putting them in a position where they have to follow uh, much more strict regulations. Mm-hmm. Their access to capital is limited mm-hmm. uh, in a much greater way, not just because of their background right. and because of uh, all of that, but also because of uh, specific requirements in order to get that license. And so mm-hmm. I think that there's a lot of space there to look at, too. Yeah, great. Uh, next. Thank you so much for these really refreshing perspectives. I'm curious, in, in light of the impending presidential election that we have coming up, which candidate you think is the strongest on drug policy? Mm. That is a wonderful question, and it's not an easy one, right? Because I, I want to remind folks, it's not really a left or right issue. There are lots of Republicans who are interested in specific laws uh, when it comes to harm reduction or psychedelics or cannabis. Uh, th- so it's really not a red versus blue issue. Um, I think that the uh, this current White House, the administration, is certainly willing to campaign on these issues. Mm. They're certainly willing to try to get the marijuana vote. I think that we need to be very careful about if giving it to them is something that they have earned. You know, uh, you could say the Trump administration, when Trump was in the office, he actually pardoned people. He got people out of prison for cannabis. Hmm. Biden has not gotten a single person, not one, zero people have been released as a result of his two major cannabis pardons, right? They're talking about it. I think that that's a positive. They want to engage on it. 
because they think that it's going to get them votes. I think it's important that we push back and say, you know, whoever is getting that vote, whether it's team red, whether it's team blue, whether it's something else, they're actually doing the work. They're letting people out of prison. They're clearing those records. They're changing the laws. Great. Next question. Kat, uh, Nick asked you uh, what would be the best state doing the best job so far, but would you mention a country that is doing the best hmm. job around? And the other thing is just because we keep mentioning licensing. I come from Brazil. In Brazil, you don't need a license to sell alcohol or you don't change, you don't change like it is for, it's allowed to sell alcohol in a market or in a church. Like people sell alcohol in churches and uh, they drink alcohol in the streets. Do you see the U.S. ever getting there? Hmm. I mean, in New Orleans, right? There are places. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I will point out the Catholic mass is built around wine. So, Right. I mean, I think that there are social norms, right, and social lies that we tell ourselves. Hmm. People drink on the streets all the time in New York. They are just putting a little yeah. paper bag over it or do you, a cooler. Do you think, is there a country, I mean, people for a long time uh, looked at Portugal for, for decriminalization, but that's kind of, they've changed a bunch of their laws. Mm -hmm. But is there a country you think that is really moving towards a, a good model of drug uh, Yeah, law? that's a great question. I was thinking about it when Isa brought it up. I would have said Portugal before. Hmm. I might still say Portugal now, but it's mm -hmm. difficult. I think it depends on the issue, mm -hmm. um, on the particular drug. There's a patchwork. Some, yeah. some places are doing better on one thing. Some places are doing better on another. But I do think that we are now in a space where countries increasingly are realizing that these policies don't work. I think mm -hmm. also, say what you will for um, U.S. imperialism or hegemony or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, but... Uh, a lot of places around the world have horrible, horrific responses to drugs and drug use and, uh, you know, up to the death penalty or things like that. And a lot of that is because the U.S. led these policies. Mm -hmm. And as the U.S. has had to turn inwards a little mm -hmm. bit more uh, and hasn't been as involved in and we still are. We still are, but hasn't been as involved in enforcing drug laws around the world. I think that there's a lot more appetite for rethinking how these things should work. Right. Question. Yes. Well, I guess there's several, but I'll just, just pick one. one. Just one. How much can we actually blame on the war on drugs? Because I've noticed what? I've noticed during the 1960s there was a massive crime wave before President Nixon officially launched the federal drug war. And also, we had a massive crime drop during the tough on crime, broken window era in the 90s, at which point drug legalization, I mean, wasn't exactly in full swing. How much can we actually blame on the war on drugs? Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I want to say that, yes, of course, Nixon uh, created what we consider the war on drug policies, and then they were ramped up under Reagan, of course, but... Drug prohibition had existed since long before then, and I do think that uh, we saw a lot of problems resulting from it. Uh, you know, what does drug prohibition look like? I mean, alcohol prohibition is a war on drugs, right? We saw how that didn't work. Um, yes, is the entire problem policy? No, there's a lot of other problems. There's stigma. There's a wider thing, but I, it certainly doesn't help, and it makes the situation a lot worse. And I would say that, you know, even with the tough-on-crime policing that we saw in the 90s, we saw a lot of deaths from overdose that happened in the 90s. We saw a lot of uh, a lot of people get really alienated from their communities. We saw a lot of negatives that came out of that as well. And we saw a lot of people get locked up for decades for things that they really shouldn't have. And I don't think we know the full impact. And I do think it is a largely negative impact on communities that did lose people, communities that uh, had uh, families broken up, that had uh, no fathers in the home, that had no, uh, no hope anymore, hope taken away from them. So I think that this, I, I would say that the war on drugs, I think we can pretty clearly say was a failure, even if it's not just around drug policy or drug use. Thank you. Uh, two, uh, two final questions. Go ahead. Um, I appreciate you really sticking firmly on your belief and in, in changing the stigma on drugs without making an argument out of every piece in your interview today. 
Um, and I wanted to see if you could speak to, uh, you mentioned safe use site centers um, in regard to a safe space to use a supply that is safe. And if we could speak more to that, like if, if there's anything else that is a necessity of that. What does the safe supply look like? Is that the question? Um, no, like so, you know, let's say, you know, this is a room and let's say we have a safe supply here for everyone to use, but outside of that, beyond that, then what? Right now, now you can use something and then what? What if you don't want to use any more? What if you we want to work, but you have been using, so where are you going to work at? You know, like yeah. the, the additional pieces that I come with that. I think there's a lot. So part of that is uh, expungement, record sealing, clearing charges from people's records. Uh, we actually just launched SSDP, uh, breaking the paper shackles. Um, and they are called paper shackles because people have a criminal record. They may not even have gone to prison for it. Maybe they just had a charge that they thought was dismissed, but it's popping up and, you know, now they're not able to get a job. They're not able to move forward. They may not even know that it's what's holding them back. So th th there is that stuff um, that is happening there. Um, but as far as what a safe supply, what a safe space could look like, I think it really is about integrating that better into the community. It's about making uh, all supply safer. It's about having legal pathways for people to be able to pursue drugs within those spaces, but also outside of those spaces. It's about people being able to seek out help when they want it and having it be the right help that works for them because there isn't one right model, right? You know, 12 step works for some people. It doesn't work for most people. Um, complete abstinence works for some people. It doesn't work for uh, most people. You know, we've seen things like methadone assisted therapy might be really helpful for uh, some for a lot of people who have opioid use disorder, uh, maybe not all people, and certainly not when you have a model where people have to go to a specific place multiple times a day to get it. Now, how are they going to get a job, hmm. right? Like, maybe they could just get that dosage and then go do their job, especially if they're able to use it safely, just like we expect, you know, we don't expect a diabetic to go get their insulin shots from the doctor multiple times a day, but we do in this situation. And so I think that we really need to kind of change our mindsets about these. How can the psychedelic community be better allied with um, the movement to decriminalize all drugs? Okay. Yes. Great question. Very good question. <laughs> can we like, edit this back yeah. in? Because it's a great okay. question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Nick and I talked about psychedelic exceptionalism earlier and unfortunately not on this podcast. No. But I think that this is an ongoing huge problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, people are looking at it as, oh, psychedelics, they can open up this world. And um, there's a lot of magical thinking where we forget about the role of the state. I, um, I went to a very interesting conversation uh, recently about psychedelic parenting, right? And what that looks like and, you know, what parenting in a psychedelic friendly space might look like. And at no point in this discussion did anyone bring up CPS or the police. And I do think that for the average person, you know, it, uh, for the average parent who's thinking about like, hey, can I use these drugs? They're absolutely worried about if yeah. their child is going to get taken away from them. Right. And so uh, this is a huge problem. We need to continue looking at the role of the state, the role of prohibition. And I think we also need to remember that, you know, your favorite drug might be something that you think is just fine, but that doesn't mean that someone else who's using some other drug that maybe you don't like and you don't want to use is a horrible person who deserves to be locked up. And so I think we really need to remember this. We need to remember the role that psychedelics play in the larger war on drugs. We need to remember um, the, the larger landscape here and understand that in all cases, prohibition is the problem and we need to end prohibition and we need to free people as a libertarian in the pro-drug space do you see yourself challenged in any ways um on your libertarian convictions that maybe there's some role for more government in certain areas could you elaborate on any of those um <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you that I personally do not think that there is a role for government in very much at all. Uh, however, however, I don't think that 
everybody in the drug policy space would say that. I think that, the, you know, uh, there is probably a, an argument for federalism here, right? And for, uh, you know, as much as we can, having uh, more local-based decisions and letting people vo vote with their feet and go live in the places that have better laws. And I think that we're going to increasingly, over time, see people moving to freer places with lower taxes, less people getting locked up, and more people feeling free and open to live their lives how they want to. Okay. Um, we are going to end it there. I want to thank Kat Murdy of Central Drug Policy for talking uh, with the recent interview. Thank you so much, Kat. What's the, where's the best place to find out more about you and SSDP? You can find anything about SSDP at ssdp.org. Uh, if you want to find out about the work we're doing around DOI and DOC, go to ssdp.org slash don't block psychedelic research uh, or find us on all social media. You can find me on social media as at Kat Murphy. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs>